Joanna Streetly. Um, I'm a writer and an illustrator. I've been living um, on the coast for about 30 years, and many of them I've lived in this float house, which I made my, myself by default, really, um, because there wasn't a place to live, if you can imagine that, and if you know, and you clue it. Even though I do do um, a lot of illustration and oil paintings, uh, more and more I've been choosing writing, or writing's been choosing me, and I'm currently at work on my fifth book, which I'm in the final stages of right now, so it's all I can think about. You could say I'm a bit obsessed at the moment. When I first arrived here, I was working as a kayak guide and guiding whale watching trips, and I did that for many years. I worked for Tofino Sea Kayaking and the Clockwood Whaler. Then I ran into Frank Harper. He's, he's been um, passed for a while now, but he was kind of a guru in, uh, in his field of interest, which was people. But he was also a reporter, and he'd lived for years down in the States and, and taught. He'd come up here to kind of get away from the war. He lived out at Catface. He started the Sound magazine, and he loved a story and he loved everybody's stories. And he was one of those magnetic people who drew people to him. He loved people and he admired their, even their smallest skills and um, had great faith in their abilities. There's really something to be said for mentoring others, which is something I believe he did by encouraging people to be the best they could be. And so he started me working on the sound magazine, the sound newspaper way back in the day and just gently kind of nudged me more and more into writing. You know, I, I was kind of on that path, but he, he really pushed me over the edge when he suggested that Jan Brubaker and I take over the sound and do it as a collaboration between us because she had um, graphic design skills and photography and she knew how to run the computer. And this was kind of back in the day when uh, we were still doing cut and paste. So we were literally cutting up things and pasting them. There would be like photocopying parties and folding parties and after print parties and Barb Campbell would bring her pickles and Jeff would bring his tabbouleh and you know, like everybody, it, it became, it was such a community event. He wanted it to be news. He loved a story, he loved conflict, he loved taking something that had happened here and making it into a very, very vivid, multi-layered um, event. Jen and I, we were not really hard news, although we did do the council notes and all those kinds of things, but we were more into creative writing and arts and encouraging arts in the community. So we would have kind of a reader's write series where you give a theme and receive submissions on the theme. We had a lot of columns that we tried to maintain about local interest. Um, Adrian Mason had one about history, walk and time, and Chris Lowther used to write one about uh, her float house. They were kind of regular things. And, and Frank used to write a column he called Journeys. He never really um, journeyed further than the junction, and he was seldom actually ever journeying in a vehicle, um, <laughs> so they were often more internal journeys. But he did actually end up putting all those together into a book called Journeys, which is a book of memoir for him. At that time I wrote my first book. The first book actually was just a fluke. Raincoast Books were looking for someone to add another book to their Raincoast Journey series and they wanted someone to write one about Clockwood and I walked into the kayak store where I had used to work um, and Dorothy said, oh, well here's the perfect person to write this because I'd already been doing the sound for a few years and um, I was a kayak guide and, and they wanted, uh, and I'd been a, a kind of a nature guide for a good portion of my life so, so I knew quite a bit about the area. The, the publisher just asked me to put in a proposal, which I did. It was unanimously approved and I just kind of got the contract to write the book. And I didn't really think that much about it, but I mean, since then I've, I've run into so many people who just getting that first publication 
is such a brutal step. And it's one of those steps that everything else hinges on that. Like once I had that first book, I could then apply to Canada Council for grants to write books, which is how I wrote my next book or BC Arts Council or Canada Council. Like you have to have a publication before you can get a grant to write a book. It's a, it's a catch 22 and so many writers and artists actually are just trapped in that catch 22 because they, they can't get published because they haven't been published yet. They can't get a, a grant because they haven't been published yet. So how do you get published? As we were stopping doing the sound magazine, I decided to go freelance as a writer. The first book um, was around the time that I was writing quite a bit for BBC Wildlife magazine and uh, just doing odd projects and realizing that it's really hard to be a freelance anything in Tofino. I mean, we were just getting email back then. So, you know, you'd be like, sending your stories out on a fax machine, hoping that the number was correct and things would arrive in the mail like months after you had generated them. Uh, anyway, it was a tough time to be freelance. Persistence is huge. And as a writer, persistence is one of those du dual-edged swords where uh, we, we often get told as writers that if you're not getting enough rejections, you're not submitting enough work and that you should wear your rejections like some kind of badge of merit, you know. But when you think about it, I mean, what a brutal way to live, uh, to live in, in a state of constant rejection. How hard is that on your morale uh, to be constantly getting notes saying, no, we, we don't, we're not going to publish it, no, we, you know. And, and I know for me as a writer, before I send something in for a publication, I will obsess about it for weeks or months and, and, and there's nothing else I think about. Like I try to, I'm polishing this thing until it is the best it can be. And when that is rejected, it's devastating. And those are really hard blows for people to come to terms with. And, and I recently did an article on this for WordWorks magazine, and I interviewed a lot of poets about rejection. Really, all of them talked about, yes, it does hurt. And then they talk about, well, did I get feedback on why it was rejected? And, and you know, maybe this is just the zeitgeist. This doesn't fit the zeitgeist at the moment. Or maybe this didn't actually fit the requirements of the publication, or maybe I didn't properly interpret the request for work, people will look at all of that. But nearly everybody said that to feel better about a rejection, they, they loved just getting right back into the throes of making. Yvonne Bloomer, I believe, said, having my hands immersed in the muck of making is when I'm most happy. I thought that was a lovely thing to say. And then finding community is the other thing that will help you with that. So reaching out to other people in your genre and uh, either helping them, which is also part of a circle of, you know, you're not just receiving help, but it also makes you feel good to, to give help where you can. And uh, just some, somehow creating a community, which for me and Clockwood Sound, the Clockwood Writers Group has been that community the writers group is just a very warm and supportive place um, if you're starting out. Is that, you think that's part of the reason that writers who are commonly seen as such solitary people find each other is like to, to bathe together in the trauma and work through it? It's like a group <laughs> therapy thing? Yeah, it's like nobody else understands who I am. <laughs> nobody else understands this this pain, this, this, this terrible thing that we go through to create. It is a bit of that kind of a mutual uh, understanding. It's also a mutual appreciation of work. It's uh, feedback. If you're writing into the void all the time, you're never getting that creative feedback that that changes how you see see your your own work. You know, and feedback is really critical to 
betterment of, of yourself, you know. One of the things I love about the Clockwork Writers Group is that, we, you know, we've really learned a lot about how to give feedback in ways that's really constructive, and I keep learning more about that because the feedback is also something that can be harmful to people if it's not really well given, you know. So that's another thing that I notice all of us have been doing well is, is really, you know, not going in there with a crowbar and saying, well, <laughs> let's get this out of here, you know, but saying, oh, yeah, so what was your motivation behind writing this? And why did you choose that name? I'm really curious about that name. And then, oh, you know, maybe... Well, so when I heard that name, it just made me think of this, and, and so I immediately went to a different place than you were intending when you chose that name, you know, yeah. so that you can really reveal how, mirror how the work is being read. I think that one of the really valuable things about small communities is that you have the chance to be a big cog in a small wheel, and that is really, really valuable. I grew up in the West Indies, I was in Trinidad. People kind of know each other on a more close level like we do here in, in Tofino, whereas then I moved for a while to England and clearly over there you are a very small cog in a very big wheel and not very many people would know you. And so applying for anything, just even watching a, a British friend of mine trying to get her work published when I, she was clearly a brilliant author, but all of the very formal hoops she had to, to go through to get to where she was. Whereas I was here um, with not really any formal training as a writer, and I walk into the kayak store and Dorothy says, oh yeah, Carol Watterson uh, wants um, a book written about Clackwood Sound. You're the perfect person. Okay, sure. You know, poof. How likely are those kinds of things going to be to happen. But that's not to say that that would happen in any small community, particularly this community, I think, has, has some exceptional community members who would be interested enough in those kinds of things that a publisher would approach them and ask them their opinion, for instance. Dorothy Barrett, who I really miss, she she's... Um, She's a very much missed member of the community. Uh, she was a big, big fan of writing and the arts and was always looking for ways to support artists. She would contract me to write a poem about something and then go stand up at the chamber meeting and deliver it, you know? <laughs> Gosh, uh, how many people would just do that because they wanted to support a writer and they wanted to deliver information in a better way? So this community particularly has mentors within it who are accessible, maybe becoming less accessible as community grows, but still we're, we're still at that stage where if you're seeking mentorship, you're likely to be able to get help in some way uh, and be recognized in some way. Oh yeah, there's a new person in town and they do this, you know, um, oh great. Clockwood Sound definitely is one of those places that has a huge, huge electrical current of some sort that people respond to when they come here. There is some kind of earth magic connection people have with this place that makes them come alive. I don't think it's a coincidence that there are so many creative people here. You know, creative people come to places where they feel um, able to create and Clockwood Sound is definitely one of those places. So in terms of mentorship, the other person who just hugely kind of key in this community and so sorely missed um, is Henry Nola. You just couldn't walk by his spot on the beach without him putting a piece of wood in your hand, putting a carving tool in your hand, and just somehow having that faith in you and your abilities and giving you all of the wisdom that he had in, in a way that was always humorous. I helped carve um, one of the totem poles that's over 
you know, pits it with Henry and Billy Martin was doing some of it and Carl Martin was doing some of it. And, you know, there were quite a few guys. And so one of the f figures was a female figure. Um, she was kind of a, uh, very clearly female figure. And so they just basically gave her to me to do. And so I, you know, I, I just worked on her so, so hard. When I finished, I, I realized, oh, I'm done. You know, I'm done. So I called Henry over and I said, I think I'm done. What do you think? You know, and he always just had that twinkle in his eye. Uh, you never knew what he was going to say. And he kind of looked at it from this angle and he looked at it from this angle. And, you know, I'm holding my breath the whole time. Like, is it good enough? Will it do? Like, did I do okay? He, he kind of looked at it and then he turned and he looked at me with that little side eye that he had and he said, you know, they say you carve in your own image. <laughs> and I looked down at this naked figure <laughs> before me. And I was so embarrassed. <laughs> But that was, a, you know, that was Henry. He just, he never missed an opportunity to give somebody a bit of a, a razzing or a fun time. And I can, I can actually walk past that totem pole now and, and not, not feel too embarrassed. It was wonderful. Um, you know, sometimes everything collides at once. That's just the way things happen. It's, uh, you know, everything happens at once. All the cards fall at once. And I had just published Wild Fierce Life um, when I was made Poet Laureate. And so I was having book tours and readings and it, a lot of events were all happening. That made me feel really torn because, of course, I want to advance my career and my own writing career and not say no to anything in that department. But then the Poet Laureate role was, was something that I wanted. If I hadn't had another job, it would have been just the best thing. Like, I would still want to be doing it now. You know, there are just so many wonderful things about that role and the opportunities that it, that it offers. And really one of my favorite things about that role was that I got to connect school students and elders because um, I got to choose my projects. So I did the Before the Road project and connected up students from Hartwood between 10 and 6 with um, Ellen Komodo from Ukulele, and she was talking about the experience of the Japanese, the RCMP coming and knocking on the door and then having, being allowed to take one suitcase and, and having to leave to go um, for internment. And those Hartwood students, I mean, the poems that they wrote about Ellen's story were just incredible. And the things that, that were so huge for them, the, the noise of the the knock on the door. For some of them, the fact that Ellen's mom took with her her tea set. She had like one suitcase and one baby and what she put in the suitcase was really important to them, the fact that she took her tea set with her. Just their whole response to the story and, and how much impact it made on them. And then we also did that at the Euclid Secondary School with a grade Aids, I think. Then also Tom Curley, um, who's an elder, Clauquit, uh, um elder. Well, he's originally from Manhattan. So he sat in that circle of uh, students and he told about being five years old and being paddled over to Kakawis um, Christie Residential School by his parents and uh, turning around and seeing his parents paddle away because it was the law they had to leave him, they had to leave him there. He told that story and I mean, I was impossible to not, I mean, I'm tear up just thinking about him soldiering through the telling of that story because he, he, he was so emotional and that emotion communicated itself to the students so that when they wrote their poems in response to his story, they had been changed by hearing his story. And for me, 
What a privilege. I, I wasn't expecting him to tell that story. I thought he was just going to talk about how life was like before electricity and phones and all those things. But he just waded right in. He was determined to have that story be known. And one of the lovely things about that was um, I asked him how he'd like to be um, introduced. And he said, well, you know, one of the things that they took away from me at the residential school was my name. And my name was given to me. My, my, I think it was his uncle that gave him the name Anitz Nas. And so all the children called him Anitz Nas. It was really important and, and it was so, so huge for them to see that, you know, to imagine having your name taken away. I mean, that was a great privilege right there. I didn't get to... Um, do as much of my second project as I would have liked. I did the SoundRange um, website, um, but I ended up ma making it a pilot project because the, what it turned into was something that was going to need a lot of funding, and I didn't end up getting the, f the full amount of the funding. So I just did the pilot project website. That included um, recordings of elders speaking, the names of places in the sound, and making a map with um, the First Nations names of all the places in the sound and people having poems that reflected soundscapes. And then we actually had sound recordings so that you could hear natural sounds, but then you could also see that, for instance, the closer you got to Tofino, the more unnatural. I'm gonna shoot for the stars here. I would like to have finished my manuscript been accepted by an agent and have a contract with a publisher. I would like to have mapped out my next book, which I do have in mind, and have put that in to the agent as well. But that's, yeah. you know.